our presenter. You guys already know her, so I'm not going to take time to uh, introduce her. But uh, just in short, Sarah and I have been friends for um, some time now, for a while. And I love her. She's she's like, you know, she's my sister. And, sure. yeah. <laughs> JK. <laughs> and she, she's super sweet, but she's also very knowledgeable uh, in all things health. She loves health. And tonight she's going to be speaking about cancer prevention. So I look forward to hearing what she has to say. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Sarah. Thank you, SJ. So ladies, how you guys been? And there was silence. I was all, I'm, I'm sorry, I've been all right. And you? I've been blessed, I've been blessed. Good, everybody says good. I've seen Jane saying that she's good. And I'm sure you guys are doing well, you know, despite life's trials here and there. And it's a pleasure to have wonderful, I'd like to hear that, wonderful. She's doing wonderfully, Laverne. Welcome everyone. So tonight I have to switch off the hostess hat and put on the speaker's hat and share this information. And Sarah Jane, thank you so much for holding us down for the past, you know, three weeks, three weeks, I think, I believe. And um, the Elevate Women's Wellness series has been going dynamically. Uh, I have been blessed by Jennifer Alvarado and Donisha with her two presentations on gut health as well as uh, reproductive health and hormonal health. That Those were so informative. And uh, today, uh, this evening, we're going to be capping it off or culminating it with cancer prevention. Now, why is cancer prevention so important uh, to me? Uh, it's because I have had, uh, how to say, I've had pe people in my life that, you know, I've lost as a result of cancer. And, in, and it just so happened in my training as a nurse that I ended up on the oncology unit at you know, one of the hospitals in Toronto where I'm from. And, and it was during my time there that I really saw what a beast cancer is. Cancer is a, it's a beast, it's a demon. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's just a total complete curse as it is in and of itself. I've, uh, I've worked under oncologists and I've seen various types of uh, cancers you know, you can name it. And let me tell you something, cancer is no respecter of persons, okay? Cancer is no respecter of persons. Cancer will come for your child. It will come for your young mother. It will come for your young brother. It will come for your, your sweet granny. It will come for anybody in your, in your family. It can come for us as well. And uh, as a group, as a family of women, we, I think it's best that we understand as much as is possible and that is in our control. Let us see how we can, I wouldn't say control fate, but uh, as much as possible using lifestyle, using what we know, prevent it, all right? Now prevention in by definition, and I'm gonna share my slides in a minute, but prevention by definition means to stop something from happening. Now, this is where my caveat or my disclaimer, as you would say, would come in. Uh, even though I am a healthcare professional, as a nurse, I'm not a medical physician. I'm not a physician, I'm not an oncologist. Um, this information that I'm, I'll be sharing is purely that information that I've gathered from very good research-based evidence. And, um, I'm not claiming that this information is going to heal anyone, uh, but I, I think that it's good information that could help us to be aware. So consider this an educational presentation. And also I would like to um, just say that this may be triggering to some people potentially because of um, the just the nature of cancer. You know, we would have lost, you know, dear family members um, and loved ones. And if you have, and you could probably indicate in the in the chat box, um, if you have had lost somebody very close to you or somebody that you just knew, um, I'm so sorry for that. I'm you know so sorry for your loss, and uh, and even if somebody in your family right now is ailing with cancer, you know my heart goes out to you and to your family and to your your loved one, and you know we'll be praying that. Uh, for healing in Jesus name. So I'm just gonna, 
share my screen right now. Let me know if you're all seeing the screen. Can you guys see that? Yeah? All right. All right. Okie dokie. So let me just pray the jitters away, if you guys don't mind, and then we can start. Okay? So let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be alive at this time. and. Um, information is accessible to all of us and we thank you for giving us this opportunity and as uh, i speak we ask your holy spirit to take control we ask for the information to be clear to be concise and to be effectual we thank you in jesus name amen so simply put this is cancer prevention and um, i'll be going through it's very simple but it's also dense you'll be going through you know what is cancer some definitions some recommendations and then we'll wrap it up by God's grace within an hour. Okay, so what is cancer? Cancer, definition wise, it's a group of diseases characterized by uncontrolled and unregulated growth of cells. Okay, and in order to really understand how this occurs, the, it, it's best to compare it to what the ideal is. So our bodies are made up of, um, our bodies are made up of cells. We are cell making machines. We are, we, on a very basic level, we are made up of these tiny little building blocks called cells. And it is the, 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 the nucleus of what our lives are made of. And within each cell, we have these different nucleus or nuclei, plural, and they all contain chromosomes. And those chromosomes contain genetic information on them that determine what the color of your eyes would be, what um, that determines if your hair will be curly, if it'll be black, if it'll be blonde, whatever the case might be. And naturally, these cells, a normal cell would, would you know, exist within the body. It, de it depends on whatever different type of cell it might be. And uh, so if and then once that cell goes through its lifespan, it dies. So for example, a skin cell would live for like about two to three weeks. Oh yeah, and then it would die. And a new one is, is, is born, so to speak. Uh, we would have, um, what's another example of a cell? Uh, for example, our colon cells, the cells that align the, the, our colon, it's, um, it lives for about only about four days. So different cells have different lifespans. Um, on our other extreme now, we have the brain cells. Some brain cells can live, you know, for a very, very long time, right? So this is why, you know, as we get older, we find our memory dissipating <laughs> over time because it's not as renewed as easily as some other cells might be. Now, uh, the process of, you know, those cells being born and those cells dying is something called is something called apoptosis. Has anybody ever heard of the, the term apoptosis before? Yep, let me see. How do I get to back to this? Apoptosis. Yep, yep, everybody's saying yep. Okay, somebody says no. All right, so essentially apoptosis is just a big old medical term for a cell death. So when a cell is born until a cell dies, it, it it's that process or of the cell dying is called apoptosis. And I'll just walk you guys through it really, really briefly. And I think it was powerful because to, to understand this process because there's actually a life lesson or a bit of an object lesson, if you may, in seeing the process called apoptosis. So here you have your normal cell. And then once that cell is you know, finished with this business and God said, you know what, it's time for you to go, uh, the cell basically shrinks, all right? Or it condenses, it starts to just, suck in and then the membranes start you know disintegrating and before you know it the the contents of the nucleus becomes the um, starts a fragment and it breaks down and then it forms these tiny little fragments which is called apoptic bodies and um and then it becomes engulfed through the process of phagocytosis and it's released from the body through the process of elimination right and Apoptosis is very important because you want those cells 
to leave the body. You want those dead cells to leave the body, all right? And when those dead cells do not exit the body, guess what happens? You have, you have, um, so here we have apoptosis again. When apoptosis takes place, you don't have a cancer risk. But when the cells continue to divide and grow and prolifer pl proliferate, I can never say that word, <laughs> it's called, it could potentially lead to cancer. All right. So like we see here in, in our initial slide, we have our normal cells lined up here, and then we have our cancer cells that just proliferate continuously. And how they look, um, a normal cell has a very defined, you know, circumference. They're very organized. Um, it usually is, has a, it usually has, um, the nuclei are usually uniformed and smaller. But with the cancerous cells, you see they have a, a variety of different shapes and sizes in the cells. They are so dis very, very disorganized. Uh, the nucleus is much bigger. It's much darker. Um, they have an abnormal number of chromosomes within the nucleus. And they, they form these, these big clusters over time. And, um, and these cancerous cells, once they um, continue to proliferate within the body, they they can attach onto blood sources and blood vessels become attached to them. And then that's how they start growing within the body. The body. It's literally like a parasite, okay, within the body. Um, so what, what, what potentially causes cancer to take place? What could cause cancer to take place? Now, there are so many different things that could cause cancer to take place, right? And, um, uh, What's this thing here? Sorry, technical issues. Um, but these, these causes are sometimes in our control, but sometimes they are not in our control. So, uh, you know, we would address some of these causes tonight, but um, we never know what could happen. Okay, just a heads up. So there are various causes. There are some physical causes, there are chemical causes, there are um, bacterial causes. So some of the physical causes, we have viral infections. Now, I, you know, maybe some of you would have already known uh, if that cancer could be caused by viruses, certain viruses. And one of those viruses is called the Epstein-Barr virus or EBV. Uh, have you ever heard about mono before? Has anybody ever heard about mono or the kissing disease? Let's see here. Right, yes. So some, some of you all have heard about mono. Yep. Okay. So the big medical term for mono is essentially called Epstein-Barr virus. And how it is spread, it is spread through uh, saliva. Okay. So some you could actually kiss someone and, you know, their saliva gets in touch with you. And then, um, you know, God forbid, you could contract this infection called uh, mononucleosis or the Epstein-Barr virus. And studies have shown that it is linked to nasopharyngeal cancer, Burkitt lymphoma, um, some cases of Hodgkin's disease, uh, which is a type of um, white blood cell cancer. Uh, hepatitis B and C. Um, no, those are, you know, typically contracted through like needles, um, substance abuse, unprotected sex, bodily fluids, so forth. And um, they can cause an increased risk of liver cancer. Uh, you have the human papilloma virus or the HPV virus. Um, it is the, <clears throat> it, can, it leads to, it could lead to can, uh, cervical cancer. And cervical cancer is actually the second leading female cancer there is in the world today. So uh, it, that's why, you know, for us women who are over 25, over 30, you know, our, if your family physician might say, you know, you, you should get a pap smear done every year. Uh, then uh, the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV, uh, it doesn't necessarily cause a cancer, but because these individuals are so immunosuppressed, their immune systems are so weak, they are susceptible to can you know get in different types of illnesses, all right, um, including cancer, and then you have the herpes virus. Um, sorry, the human herpes virus or the HHV8, and this this um, virus has been known to 
uh, leads a, a, a particular type of cancer called um, Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma, and it's rare, but this type of cancer is found in the soft tissue. So you find it like in your, um, your lymph nodes, like it says, your skin, your mucous membranes. And this one is also contracted through sexual intercourse. <clears throat> Now, there are parasites that, that could uh, potentially lead to getting cancer. So here are a couple of parasites. Um, to pronounce it is not an easy task, <laughs> but you have liver flukes. Liver flukes uh, is a type of flatworm. And these liver flukes are found like in, you know, places are typically tropical climates. Not, it's not popular in the United States or in Canada. In, in temperate regions, but more so like in the Caribbean, in a warmer temp, um, tropical climates. And, uh, you, you know, you get it in, in Asia, these different um, Pacific Asian regions and so forth. And you can, you can contract these by eating any raw and undercooked fish, raw and undercooked fish, okay? Typically freshwater fish. And there's another type called the schistos schistosoma hematobium and it can lead to schistosomiasis. And that, that infection there can potentially lead to bladder cancer. And I found this to be pretty crazy, you know, to think that you might go traveling and, you know, if you're not careful of what you eat or, you know, yeah, the, you know, who you eat from, you could potentially get a, a, a parasitic infection that could lead to cancer. No, there are some bacterial infections. Some of you all may have heard of H. pylori already. Uh, some of these causes, um, you know, severe uh, inflammation of the, um, the stomach lining or the gut lining that um, you can contract as a result of contaminated food and water and even mouth to mouth. So you can even kiss someone and um, contract this back, um, bacteria. Uh, you can all, this, this leads to stomach cancer. Now, stomach cancer isn't that popular um, as a result of this bacterial infection, but it still occurs. It still occurs. And then you have chlamydia, chlamydia tractomatis. And um, this is a potential cause of cervical cancer. And again, chlamydia, it's a sexually transmitted infection and so that you can get through um, unprotected sex. There are some chemical causes as well. You have UV radiation, whether it's um, natural from the sun or if it's <clears throat> from a, a tanning bed, uh, you get um, you could potentially can get cancer from X-rays and gamma rays. This is why, you know, when you go for your, <clears throat> if you've ever had to go for a mammogram, they put on a, a big lead vest around, you know, your abdominal region. That's to protect your organs and to protect your trunk from um, radioactive waves. Um, some other causes or some other, you know, sources is things like, you know, electronic low frequency radiation. Um, so those are things like, you know, your Wi-Fi's, you know, um, you have your cell phones, your smart devices. It could even be, you know, from cell phone towers. I'm, I'm not a conspiracist or anything like that. And this information is literally from the American Cancer Society. Uh, I just put all my references at the end. So it's not, you know, me just looking up some weird website <laughs> and giving you guys some information. Um, it's, this is information from the American Cancer Society um, you, that you can check out yourself. Now, this is an abbreviated, <laughs> this is an abbreviated list of common and known human carcinogens. Now, what is a carcinogen? Uh, a carcinogen is something that can cause cancer. However, not all carcinogens have been found to cause cancer, but for, some, for whatever reason, whoever defined it, defined it as can cause cancer, all right? Now, the reason why I listed these are because they are so common and frequent in our lives. So we have, the, for, the, for the first one, acetal, uh, acetaldehyde, um, I think I spelled that wrong. And you can get that from consuming alcoholic beverages. And then we have alcoholic beverages, asbestos. I remember when I went to school, um, high school in the Caribbean, they sent us home one day because they found out that the, the walls had um, asbestos in it. So we had to like go home. And so up to this day, sometimes I wonder if my allergies 
is as a result of you know the asbestos that I was exposed to in my um in my in my younger years. Uh, we have coal. Now coal, you guys know what coal is. It's burnt wood, and uh, this is why you know they warn us about barbecued food and food that is like you know you put it on the grill and it gets nice and burnt and it gets a nice barbecue taste. It's the coals, the tannins from the coals that could potentially cause cancer. We have diesel exhaust. Again, we have the Epstein-Barr virus or mono. Um, certain types of uh, menopausal therapy. There's one called the estrogen only menopausal therapy that is known to be linked to cancer. So they try <clears throat> as much as is possible to not necessarily use that. Um, ethanol, which is alcohol um, in alcoholic beverages, formaldehyde, um, that is something that is commonly found in everything that we use, from the paint on our walls, our carpet, to that brand new car smell, to the book that you just bought on Amazon today. Yeah. Um, leather dust, leather dust. This was a new one for me today. I didn't know that. So leather dust apparently is a known human carcinogen. Outdoor air pollution. Um, if anything else today, um, in this time that we live in using masks, one definite benefit of it is that the particles that come in the air, the pollution particles that, you know, potential protection from it. Processed meat, the consumption of any processed meat. We're talking about sausages, bacon, even if it's turkey bacon. We're talking about anything, anything that's considered a processed meat. And we'll see later down in the presentation that even regular red meat in its rawest raw form is a known carcinogen as well and linked to cancer. Salted fish. I am so sorry. <laughs> RIP to the salted fish because this is a carcinogen, you guys. Um, and I see your questions. If you don't mind, just hope put in a pin in it so I can take it after. And... Um, Vinyl chloride, not too sure what the chloride is, but I, I know vinyl is in a lot of diff different things. And wood dust, wood dust. Um, I grew up around a lot of wood dust. A family member had a, a lumber, what do you call it? A timber, a lumber yard? Yeah, they had a lumber yard. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right, and now this is by far the leading carcinogen next to alcohol in the world today, all right? In terms of a controlled carcinogen that, you know, human, you know, the public uses, smoking. Now, let me list some of these, you know, ingredients or substances found in the, in the cigarette. Um, in Trinidad, they would call it a cancer stick. And that's because they all, everybody knows that cigarettes lead to cancer, right? And to this day, they um, still put it on the, the little cart or the carton, whatever they call it, that this substance can potentially cause, you know, cancers and different things like that. Nicotine. Uh, when we think about cigarettes, we only think about nicotine, right? But cigarettes, they contain cyanide, formaldehyde, lead, arsenic, ammonia, radioactive elements, benzene, carbon monoxide. Okay, we have um, PAHs, which is the polycyclic aroma, aromatic hydrocarbons. Okay. Now, another major category that causes some cancers is obesity and weight mismanagement. Obesity and weight mismanagement. And we'll talk about it, um, some solutions further down. But obesity is actually linked to a plethora of cancers. And here are some that they are linked to. Um, again, this information is from the American Cancer Society. And the first on the list is breast cancer, breast cancer. Um, colon, colorectal cancers, endometrial cancers, which is cancer of the lining of the endometrial, which is in the reproductive system. Um, esophageal cancer, gallbladder, kidney, liver, ovarian, pancreas, stomach, thyroid, multiple myeloma, meningioma, okay? And so these are some cancers that are linked to obesity. Now, these are some recommendations and I'm going a bit fast because you guys know how time goes on us every, every Friday. 
So these are some recommendations. By no means these are cures or solutions. These are recommendations, okay? First recommendation, achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Okay, um, I've been going through paper after paper after paper, um, journal articles that is showing the connection between obesity and cancer. Okay, the obesity and cancers. Um, this study, this is just the title of the study, one study that I pulled out, um, obesity as a major risk factor for cancer. And this little excerpt I wanted you guys to see. It says, <clears throat> take screenshots or whatever you need to take. I'll send a recording once it's, um, it's all finished. It says, um, it has been estimated that about 20% of all cancers are caused by excess weight. Okay, it's caused by excess weight. And the Million Women Study, this is like one of the largest studies that ever took place when it comes to cancer research. The largest study of its kind on women has shown that approximately half can be attributed to obesity in postmenopausal women. So postmenopausal women, you're talking about, I don't know what age, it's probably 50s, 60s, around there. There are many prospective epidemiological studies which have demonstrated a direct association between overweight and cancer even though obesity alone does not apparently heighten cancer risk in all tissues by the same amount. So this one basic statement is showing us, and in this study, uh, you can read this study for yourself. It's a free paper on the internet from the Journal of Obesity. Um, this was published 2013, so it's not very old at all. Um, there is a direct association between obesity and um, cancers. And in this study, it was particularly for women in their postmenopausal um, stage of life, but it's not limited to, limited to just them. How do I go next? All right. You guys probably had some of that yesterday, yeah? <laughs> and if I tell you guys that that, that didn't look good, I would be lying. If I said that that turkey didn't look good, I would have been lying. But um, but praise God for tofu, cause you know I'm not about this life anymore. And if you are about eating meat, I judge you not. But um, you know, there's a disadvantage, and we'll take we'll take a look. Processed and red meat, processed and red meat, and I know turkey technically is is not a red meat. But there are still there's still a lot of um connections as in, into how this could um even white meat could cause um cancer. So <clears throat> even if it's smoked or it's fermented, um they are talking about uh like when it's salted. So like you have like a, a like a prosciutto or a, what else like a, a nice deli meat um usually has nitrates in them. Um, they show that even two ounces, right? Two ounces. I don't know how much two ounces is. How much? I don't know. I'm in milliliters here right now. But two ounces of meat, of red meat a day is associated with a 20% increase in colorectal cancer, right? So <clears throat> even if you just have two ounces, consider it a 20% increase in colorectal cancer. <clears throat> tannins tannins um, are the are little toxins that you know are created when you barbecue your food and you get that nice barbecue look like what you've seen here on these sausages i don't know about you guys but when i used to barbecue food i used to make it way more like charred than that because i used to love that little burnt piece that was crispy and apparently according to research that is carcinogenic uh, even in our teas, there are some teas that we we drink, um, like our Earl Grey's, our black teas. Uh, they are carcinogenic, okay? Um, so that's why I stick to just herbal teas now. And um, in this area here, you know, because we're looking at the obesity and the link between obesity and weight mismanagement, it's important to understand our body mass index. 
our body mass index and um, uh, how you can uh, you can get this using a particular machine. A lot of you guys may not have this machine, but I think that there are some stores, um, grocery stores that you can go and, is it ShopRite? I think it's ShopRite. I don't know if that's popular where you, know, you are, but you could actually go there and they have a machine. Um, it's right next to the blood pressure machine where you can put your arm in and hold onto something and they can measure your blood ma um, body mass index for you. Another way to measure it, is uh, I can't remember the manual way of measuring it. I think you have to um, know your height and your weight and see and look at a chart on a body mass index chart and see where you lie. Um, I I hope that I'm not in any of these. I think I'm in the overweight category. So pray for me. I gotta work on that. Um, according to BMI, not according to how I look, but according to BMI. All right, another. Another um, recommendation is to look at your glycemic index when it comes to your food, the glycemic index. And it's very easy to know um, the glycemic index for, for, for the food that we eat. Um, it's, a, it's a very easy Google search. Um, and after a while, you know, you kind of understand the general trend as to which foods have a very low glycemic index and a high glycemic index. So foods that have a higher glycemic index um, would be things like your pastas, like this nice saucy pasta here, um, like a piece of pizza, some white bread. Uh, those things basically, when you eat it, they taste so good. They're um, so satiating. And well, I won't say they're satiating, but they're satisfying. And they go straight into your bloodstream because it's made of sugar. It's made of just 100% sugar. And um, well, not 100%, but a lot of sugar. And the things that are much have a much um, lower glycemic index would be something like um, like a sweet potato. You know, um, it's ironic that they would call it a sweet potato when it has a much <laughs> um, that when it has a much um, lower glycemic index than a regular potato. But this study it shows that um, it's it's a study of thirty one hundred people. And it was presented at the 2016 Experimental Biology Forum. And they found out foods with a higher GI of 70 or higher on a 100 point scale, it was associated with an 88% greater risk for prostate cancer. Now I know we're addressing a group of women, but I'm sure that you all have men in your lives, whether it's a dad, an uncle, a friend, whoever it might be, a husband, a grandpa, somebody like that. Um, uh, so high GI uh, items include your sugar, um, just regular sugar. So like your candies, your Kit Kats, you know, your um, your chips, your soft drinks, your fruit juices. Even though you know you go to the store and you pick up a bottle of, I don't know, simply grapefruit juice or orange juice, it's 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 just it's full of sugar. Even though they say it's um, it might be 100% juice, it's pasteurized. It literally has no kind of nutritional value. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, but, you know, in every single recommendation, you know, I'm going to probably suggest, you know, how are we going to make it happen, right? How are we going to make this happen? And it's not easy. It's not easy to make it happen. It might be easy to, for me to just blurt all of this information out, but trust me, I understand that it is not easy to make it happen. So how do we make this happen? And we, you know, we'll carry this through with the other recommendations that take place. We have to make it goal oriented. So, you know, my mother would always say, do not bite off more than you can chew. Don't bite off more than you can chew. No pun intended, seeing that we're talking about food. But <clears throat> uh, if you only can walk, or if you can only like, uh, you know, you know, every day, just, you know, walk for like 10 minutes, start with that. All right. Start with that. If you only have twenty dollars in your name to buy some healthy vegetables, start with that. OK, make it safe. Make it positive. You know, look at the positive um, side to it. Say, man, you know, like I don't get to eat these certain things anymore. I, I'm, I'm making a choice to, you know, eat healthier foods now. Um, but I get to live longer. I get to have a, a greater quality of life. Right. The next recommendation, be physically active, right? Be physically active. 
And being physically active doesn't mean you need to necessarily go get a gym membership. It doesn't mean that you need to go buy a Fitbit or anything like that. Those things are great. Uh, being physically active just requires two legs and a motivated and determined mind. Um, another study here. I forgot to screenshot the actual name of the study, but um, it says this study is showing that the connection between between um, the body mass index and the increased risk for cancer, right? So it says more generally of the 7 million deaths that occurred from cancer worldwide in 2001, an estimated 2.47 million, more than 35% were attributable to modifiable risk factors. So, modif so risk, risk factors that are controllable. In a large prospective cohort study of, get this, over 900,000 adults, American adults, increased body mass indices were associated with an increase in death rates for all types of cancer, all types of cancer combined and at numerous cancer specific sites, both among men and women. Men and women in the highest quantile of body mass index um, that will be classified as obesity, um, equal to or over 40, they had a 52% and 62% higher death rate from cancer compared to men and women with a much lower BMI, which is less than 24.9. Um, so this study is you know, basically showing that in a study that they did, this is a huge study with 900,000 adults, those who were obese, greater death rate than those who were not, all right? So, you know, we have to watch the BMI, you know, we got to be considerate of that. And um, these are some, my personal suggestions. These are not based on research or anything. These are the things that I do. I do, you know, sometimes I do one section, sometimes I do it all in one week, sometimes I do none in a week. And I just, you know, try these different things. So for aerobics, I try running. When I don't feel like running, I jog or I do some trampoline and trampolining at home. You know what I, you know, we have like a little mini trampoline and uh, I just jump on that for like what, 10 minutes. And um, I found a study that was showing that um, even if you do trampolining for like 10 minutes, it helps to drain your lymphatic system. And it's really good for detox in the body because your lymph system essentially, it has a lot of waste in it and you want that to be clear. So um, trampolining is very, very good for draining your lymphatic system. And you have lymphs everywhere in your body, from all the way to the sides of your head, around back of your ears, down to your breast, chest area, to your groin. You got lymph nodes everywhere. So jumping, it helps to, you know, get that out. And it is also very easy on your knees. Okay, strengthening. Strengthening is very important for women, especially over the age of 20 to 25 excuse me, because it helps to um, maintain a good bone, bone density. It helps, it helps us to maintain good bone density. And uh, this would help to slow or prevent uh, diseases, bone diseases in women, such as osteoporosis and bone, other bone diseases like brittle bones and stuff like that, which is, you know, essentially osteoporosis. So strength training is very good. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you you know, you jog for a long time, you might plateau with your, your jogging, even though it's good for you and you might want to start strengthening your muscles. It's important. It's important. So you can do some weight lifting. Um, uh, when I wasn't in the gym, I would, I just went to a hardware store and I bought some weights and uh, that's what I used. I used some of that. You can do some, you know, body isolation workouts where you don't use any weights at all. And you just use your own body weight um, sometimes I do a Billy Banks workout on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know about Billy Banks, but he got some, well, he's basically aerobics. Um, and then I do some, you know, resistance bands sometimes. I forgot the word bands there. Those are, those make some really good workouts. Um, and then you want to improve, you know, your flexibility and balance. And for that, I would say stretching. Stretching is a very, very good way to, you know, work on your flexibility even right now you know you can just stretch and you know you can get some really good 20 minute stretch workout videos on youtube um, that will help 
you know, stretching, they say, is the, the, the key to, to, to youthfulness or the secret to um, being young, staying young. <laughs> and deep breathing is really important to health as well deep breathing so i would say if you did gardening it's a good way to get some you know hopefully your garden is in a, a a clean area you can get some deep breathing in or you could just just do your own deep breathing on your own again we want to make it goal oriented we want to make it safe make it positive and just make it happen just one step at a time now i want to refer you guys to the original diet and the original diet, <laughs> by no means this is a plug for the original lifestyle, but the original diet has always been around. And you guys know that I am 100% plant-based and I love it. But guys, before I adapted the original diet, I used to eat everything, every single thing. And so I, you, hmm, God is good because I never thought a time would come where I would just be eating things that come from the earth. I never thought that time would have come and it has come. And I've been plant-based for like what, five or six years, I've lost track. And uh, I have no complaints. Um, I used to have, <laughs> I used to have some little bit of, you know, a thick waist. I had some obesity in certain areas. I had terrible acne. I had terrible allergies. I had a condition known as allergic rhinitis. And um, today, I do still get irrit uh, irritabilities with my allergies and so forth. But the way in which it used to be, I don't ever have that issue again. And I attribute it to God and also the original diet. So, um, and it's interesting that the American Institute of Cancer Research, they reference this original diet. Uh, they even use the biblical term pulses, you know, within their statement. Uh, they said here in their recommendation, this is just a screenshot. They say make whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and pulses or legumes, such as beans and lentils, a major part of your normal diet. All right. Make it a major part of your normal diet. <clears throat> right. And, and they got it from God. Okay. We all got it from God. And when God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, seed for you, it shall be from meat. So this is the template that God has given us. Uh, it's a, it's a very effective template. Once we understand it, once we're educated on how it should be done. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we are not educated on how to do it. So that's why, you know, we just revert to something else that might seem easier, um, but, but it's not healthier. Now, I'm going to go through um, the American Institute for Cancer Research. They have on their website the evolution, so to speak, of the, what do you call it, the, um, the American plate or the... the the perfect plate or portion sizes and what should be in on that plate. Now in stage one, which is what they taught us some years ago, they taught us that meat and potatoes and some peas, some probably some soggy peas was the ideal, right? And it was heavy on, you know, red meat, fish, poultry, potatoes, which is a starch, which is high sugar, high, high uh, glycemic index, and some peas that probably came from who knows where and for how long it was in somebody's freezer before it came to your freezer, which has basically zero nutritional value. And, but they upped their game. So let's see what happened in the next stage. This is what they call the transitional plate, okay? And, um, and granted, if anybody is, you know, eating a diet like this right now, and this is all they could access, I understand, I understand. But when we see, you know, what the ideal plate is, it's actually very accessible. And once, once there's some level of education involved or given, it, it's, um, it's, it's doable. Now the transitional plate, here you have like a cup of rice, which is a starch, you have a piece of uh, a meat, like that's probably like what, a, 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 something like a steak and we got some green beans, okay? But they're saying that the new plate that they're advertising today, that they're encouraging, and they're educating others with, it's uh, they, they're recommending, this is not my 
my recommendation, but their recommendation is uh, a modest three ounce serving of meat, fish, poultry, red meat. I don't know why they even put red meat there when all the research shows that it's linked to cancer with uh, you know, some grain. I see they got their rice and they have some broccoli and some zucchini. I can never eat dry looking food like that. But if this is what you know the standard American diet is, then I think this is way better than what they actually had in stage one and stage two. So they actually have here some brown, they recommend some brown rice, some barley, some kasha, bulgur, millet, quinoa. Good. Those are good. Those are some good greens to have. But my ideal plate is something like this. Okay. Something like this. I have my fats here with my avocado. I have some, I don't know, brown rice, some organic non-GMO corn, some organic tomato, some nice lightly cooked kale with a little bit of green what what is that that looked like a little bit of stew something with some zucchini noodles and some of those nice lentil crackers oh that looks good okay so moving along dr food dr Fu. you know everybody talks about that quote that hippocrates made some time ago let your food be your medicine and let your medicine be made your food i just didn't put it in because it's so overused but another very good um, famous person, I think it's Thomas Edison. He says the doctor of the future will be, I'm paraphrasing, he would be using food. So let's just call it doctor food for today. Now, these foods definitely have medicinal value. And even if you, you know, you check all the references that, that I have at the end, you'll see why you'll be able to do some more research. So stay tuned for the references at the end. Um, <clears throat> But we have our cruciferous vegetables. And I don't know if you know this, but within the cells of these cruciferous vegetables, the nucleus of it, it kind of looks like a, like a cross. That's why they call it a cruci cruciferous vegetable. And I say, praise God for his grace and mercy with these vegetables because they certainly have medicinal value. Now we have kale, cauliflower, Swiss chard, collard greens, broccoli. Those are some real, real good vegetables. I love those. Now we have your beta carotene vegetables. These have been found to also help in reducing and fighting um, the free radical cells that uh, come from our, you know, carcinogens, etc. So that's like your brightly bright orange and yellow vegetables and, and fruits and roots and whatnot. So we got carrots, we have pumpkin, squash, sweet potato, and these all have very low glycemic ind indices as well. And we have our antioxidants and antioxidants are very, very essential when it comes to the destruction of free radical cells that could potentially lead to cancer. Um, FYI, dried herbs, dried herbs are the leading source of antioxidants when it comes to naturally occurring antioxidants. So cloves, I don't know if you guys know dried cloves when, you know, as a little girl growing up and my mother would cook a ham on Christmas day, she will take whole cloves and stick it in there. And uh, when I had like a, a toothache or something, she would say, here, take, a, take this clove and chew on this clove. It's actually pretty good for, um, it's a natural toothache pain reliever, natural toothache pain reliever. So cloves, peppermint, um, oregano, basil, etc. right? Um, I love putting oregano on my food. I absolutely love basil as well. And you know, in summertime, when you, you go to the stores and you see all the little basil plants or the mint plants, and uh, you know, you see like it's starting to get cold and you know, you don't know what to do with your plant. Don't worry. Just, if you want, you can just pull them, clip them with a nice little scissors and invert them or turn them upside down. I don't have a bag. And you can turn them upside down inside of like a, a brown paper bag and hang them up to dry and they dry and all of the oils all of the medicinal essential oils are preserved right in there and then with basil you can make a nice good spelt crust pizza and you could sprinkle your basil on top of there uh, my husband when he makes his his radical smoothies he puts cloves in his smoothies it actually tastes really good i had one recently and it tastes good um, peppermint you could add that to uh, I don't know, you can add it to your salads. I've seen people put it on salads. I, I don't necessarily care for a minty salad, but if, that, if that's something that you like, you can do that. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then we have your berries, all right? Berries are an excellent source of antioxidants as well. Um, when buying your berries, you really want to go for organic. Go for organic because uh, these essentially have the thinnest skins possible. So they suck all of that uh, unhealthy pesticides and stuff in there. So, yeah, they're in the Dirty 12. So get your organic, go to Whole Foods. And the price difference is not crazy. You probably would use it to buy something else that you shouldn't or don't necessarily need. Um, so get some blueberries, some raspberries, and freeze them. When they're frozen, they, they maintain some of their uh, nutritional value. <clears throat> Cooked tomatoes. Tomatoes have something called lycopene in them. They're excellent for men. It helps to slow or um, prevent inflammation of prostate cancers. Um, just a FYI on the prostate cancer, you want to stay away from a spicy diet. And I know that might be a challenge for the Caribbean Latino culture because um, it's so heavy on spice. But spice and hot peppers, habaneros and, and all these ghost peppers and bird peppers and whatever kind of peppers, they inflame the prostate gland. They inflame the prostate gland. But um, I'll, I'll, if you have a diet, if men have a diet high in curcumin, which is a, a, it's an herb and it's found in the turmeric. It actually helps with anti-inflammation. So you, it's good for them to have curcumin and like curries and that kind of stuff, but not spicy curries. So um, dark green leafy vegetables. You do want to cook, slightly cook your leafy vegetables uh, because <clears throat> it can implicate your thyroid. Um, okay, so here is a reference on um, fat when it comes to fat. Okay, so it says diet is the most important factor for the formation and prevention of cancer. This paper is referencing diet as prevention. Okay, thus in part to reduce cancer risk, two dietary goals have been achieved for the year 2000. So this is like 20 years ago. One, the caloric contribution of fat should not be more than 30% of total caloric intake, which can be achieved by reducing present fat intake by 18%. So it's recommending you drop your fat control to 18%. Then um, content, I mean to 18%. Secondly, the consumption of carbohydrate and fiber containing foods should be doubled by increasing fruit and vegetable consumption to five servings per day. She's not saying go get the spinach style pasta you need fruit and vegetables okay it says if alcoholic beverages are consumed anyway according to nci guidelines it should be taken in moderate doses i say completely eradicate with it all together and i'll show you the aicr recommendation after retinoids <clears throat> carotenoids vitamin c and vitamin e should be taken in optimum in order to control the malignant tumor, the above diet has been adopted in America for the last 20 years. Now, this information has actually been improved on. This research has been improved on since 20 years ago. But even 20 years ago, when we were probably fresh without any gray hairs in our head, okay, they were saying, drop your fat content. And that's because of the research that they see between meat consumption and unhealthy fat consumption and cancers. Now, if that is a, a source, I say do away with it. Do away with it. We are sustainable on a plant-based diet. Why not explore that? Let's move on quickly because I think what my time saying here. Have mercy. Okay. Just to continue really quickly here. Whole grains. These are some whole grains. Spelt, einkorn, millet, quinoa. I have on reference whole wheat flour and white flour. They are unhealthy. Do I personally use them sometimes? I do, and I pay for it. So let us do better. Pray for me that we like we and as we do better together. Legumes, your lentils. Lentils, let me tell you about lentils. It is the king of all legumes. It contains a plethora of good vitamins and minerals, folic acids, fiber. It has very, very good fiber. It tastes very good as well. Split peas, aka dal, excellent for your health. Kidney beans, chickpeas, black beans, black eyed peas, um, soybeans, tofu. Make sure they are organic, non-GMO. Your fruit, 
your berries, your apples, your pineapple, your avocados, your papayas. These are all very anti-inflammatory. Your roots and your bulbs, like your onions, your radishes, turmeric, ginger, garlics. These are very good forms of prebiotics, especially your onions and garlics. They are good for your gut. Um, when it comes to the alcohol, um, I read this statement that I found to be interesting. And this is not research. This is a AICR, American Institute for um, Cancer Research. And they are saying, if you are interested in taking a proactive approach to cancer prevention, it's best not to drink alcohol. Just don't, just don't use it, they're saying. Okay. Now, we're coming on to the end here now. There is... Uh, uh, there is no research that says that stress causes is a direct cause of cancer, but they are saying that it is a catalyst for those who already have cancer. And based upon science, we know that stress can cause things like dyspepsia, indigestion, um, inflammation in the gut, uh, inflammation in the brain and various things. And those, those issues can lead to cancer okay, can potentially lead to cancer. So how about we try to manage it because sometimes stress comes, whether we like it or not, and we eliminate the stressors, okay? You see sister girl here, she's going through a pandemic like us right now. Now this research said here, in patients who already have cancer, studies have found that the stress is linked to tumor growth. So this person has cancer and it makes the tumor grow, okay? tumors of, of the devil cancer is of the devil and it loves stress okay we know that high stress cancer patients tend to have a harder time in treatment and recovery and it makes sense that cancer might be hard to treat or more aggressive in these patients and i have seen that myself uh there was really quick story there was this woman, uh, let me compare these two patients that I worked with. There was this beautiful middle-aged Ethiopian woman that I was uh, caring for as a nurse in, um, in a hospital in Toronto. And she had uh, stage four cancer. And then there, were, there was uh, another woman, a Latino woman, young lady. She had cancer as well. And when you look at her, you didn't even think she had cancer. She looked so very healthy externally. And then there was a man, uh, an adult man that also had cancer. And um, I don't know, I think it's a woman thing that women are able to, to handle stress more or in a, a cope better. But those two women handled themselves so well that they outlived, even though they both had um, fourth stage cancer, third and fourth stage cancer, they outlived the, the gentleman that also had fourth stage cancer, all right? Of course, I know their circumstances may be different and so forth, but the way in which they even expressed themselves and you know, um, their, their, their level of positivities was so starkingly different when I remember them. So I, you don't even need to read this paper to see that, that you know, managing stress helps. So these are some seven tips on how to manage stress, okay? Take breaks. Take breaks, take breaks from media, from the news, from social media, Twitter, whatever, from CCN, CNN, CCN, <laughs> and so forth. Even some unhealthy people, take a break, take a break. Um, foster and maintain a healthy support system, okay? If you are blessed and privileged to have some healthy, loving people around you, take care of them, love them, learn, from, learn with them, learn from them. Um, we need people in our lives. You know, we cannot be islands and, and think that, you know, we could, um, we can survive. Be intentional about your relaxation and self-care. Be intentional about it. If it, need, if it means you need to turn your phone off and um, just have an, a, a, an evening to yourself, then do it. If it means you need to go for a walk on your own and just clear your mind, just do it. Just go do it. Adapt a healthy diet, okay? A healthy diet a healthy sleep routine. Sleep is a mystery to me. It's like you go to bed like a, a demon, you wake up like an angel <laughs> because sleep helps. Exercise regularly. Exercise, I say, man, exercise is like pray. You don't even know how good you feel until you did it. And don't forget to drink your water. Fifth, work with a Bible-based mental health professional. 
I say that because the Bible is the source of all of life's problems. And um, get, get involved in acts of kindness and service for humanity. There's research that shows that altruism actually does well for the health helping somebody else. It just could, it could just be giving them a call. It could just be saying, hey, Sarah, how are you doing? How's everything going? You know, a five minute call. And seventh, seventh says, you know, explore a relationship with Jesus. Explore a relationship with Jesus. If you don't already know who Jesus is, he helps. Now, there is, or there are, I should say, many people that are struggling with suicide and suicidal thoughts and depression that would uh, render them suicidal. And I would say if you need somebody to speak to and you really want um, a way out, consider calling the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or consider calling me. I'm available to talk if you just want somebody to listen to. And I'm sure you guys are all available to to pay a listening ear as well. And the Bible tells us in Psalm 55 and verse 22, Jesus says, cast your cares unto the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be forsaken or shaken. Um, it brings us to the end. These are some references. Believe it or not, all of this information came from very, very, you know, typical um, cancer research societies. And um, I'm, I was actually shocked because, you know, I, I didn't know that, you know, they were taking lifestyle as seriously as um, I think that they should have. And today, scientists are seeing the, the, the definite link between diet, um, lifestyle, different foods, alcohol consumption, they are seeing the, even on the AICR website, they have various fruits and vegetables that you click on them and you can see the, the health benefits of each fruit and each vegetable. They are promoting that under cancer prevention. And that's because they are seeing how many people, I think one in three people or one in two people now uh, have cancer. So um, um, I just, I just want to leave that with you guys. If you have any questions, you know, we could try to go through them. And, you know, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And God bless you all. Thank you so much, so much, Sarah. That was an amazing presentation. And praise the Lord. We never, like you said, we never have enough time to, to give to really get into it. But for the little bit of time that you had, it was really, really good. It was powerful. And I know the ladies have questions